You are just a machine, an imitation of life. Can a robot write a symphony? Can a robot turn a canvas into a beautiful masterpiece? Can you? Thank you for giving me the opportunity to respond to the very interesting talk of Ines Testoni. Um, I, I just pick up on a few points because I didn't quite pick everything up. I'm, I'm sorry, yes, well, I should try and speak into this gadget. Um, I should just address a few points that I think I understood. Uh, one was the question, the question of what microtubules have to say about life after death. As far as I'm concerned, nothing. I, do, I have never made any comment about life after death, certainly not in this context. Although my colleague Stuart ha Hameroff does sometimes make a comment about that, but I don't particularly agree with what he says there. I don't know. I have no comment to say there. I have no evidence to believe that we continue in any sense after death. It seems to me unlikely that anything like the memories that we have built up during life have any chance of surviving death. It does not mean that in some form our awareness might be reborn at some later stage in some form. I don't have any view. It's conceivable that that's true, but I don't see any evidence for that. And I don't see why uh, the idea that, co that microtubules have a strong role because they will not survive death any more than neurons. So uh, I shall leave that aside. Um, let's see, some other questions. Uh, there were questions about testing uh, for consciousness. Um, I think there are many things one can say about uh, tests. One of them is indeed um, what my colleague Stuart Hameroff is concerned with, namely general anesthesia. And this is a very clear test because general anesthesia, the general anesthetics, are things which directly affect consciousness. So if one can discover what it is they, they do in the brain, this is very important in connection with what part of the brain or what aspects of the brain are involved in consciousness. And so there have been studies, particularly some made by Stuart Hameroff and several of his colleagues in a recent paper in Nature, where they do investigate the possible... I mean, it seems to be that there are proteins which are involved. It's very interesting that general anesthetics, there's a whole range of them, including an inert gas, including all sorts of other materials which don't seem to have any chemical connection with each other. So the question is, what are they doing? And it's not a chemical process. There were some physical process, which one might understand here. I'm not, that's not my area of expertise, but they do make this study of what general anesthetics can affect, and microtubules become a strong candidate. It does seem to be that the microtubules are very much involved in the actions of general anesthetics. So I think that is an important uh, kind of test that one can make. Another kind of test is something that I always used to worry about because the, most of the discussion one makes about brains, when we talk about neurons and so on, and people tend to be talking, talking about the thing under here, which is the cerebrum. Now, the cerebrum has, I don't know, 10 to the 11 neurons, I can't remember the figures exactly, but the cerebellum, which is the part down here, which has a comparable number of neurons and many, many more connections between neurons. So you might say that the cerebellum, as an object for doing computation with neurons and so on, is doing much more than the cerebrum is. 
Nevertheless, the action of the cerebellum seems to be entirely unconscious. It's what happens, you know, if you are a good performer on the piano or a tennis player. When you, when you learn these things, you are very much controlling things consciously. But then the, cere the cerebellum learns from the cerebrum what to do, and it does it much better. So people can perform playing the piano, and, or even if you, anybody who's walking down the street, you may be you, you would learn initially how to do move your muscles and all that sort of thing, but then it becomes controlled unconsciously. And these unconscious controls, when you're doing things that don't require understanding and so on and so forth, the, the cerebellum does it much more effectively. So there's something very different about the action of the cerebrum and of the cerebellum. And what is it? And I worried about this for a long time. But I did hear recently uh, Stuart Hameroff talking about recent discoveries which seem to involve waves of activity going backwards across the brain and only at a certain level does consciousness seem to appear and that is at a level where there are many of these cells known as pyramidal cells and pyramidal cells have great numbers of microtubules in them much more than other cells and they are not found in the cerebellum so that was the first time I've heard of something where you can see a clear difference between the cerebellum and the cerebrum and this seems to be that the pyramidal cells are playing an important role. I think this is a very significant area of research, and one may be able to carry this further and understand much better. There's another thing which also intrigued me very much, which has to do with the claim that is often made that conscious willing, there are many experiments going back to Benjamin Libet a long time ago, which seems that the that there is evidence before a conscious decision is made that some activity in the brain takes place and that it somehow already knows what you're going to decide. And some people say, well, this is an evidence, evidence that the decision-making process of consciousness is not really doing anything. It's just uh, uh, what people call um, an epiphenomenon, which seems comes along for the ride and it's not really actively doing anything. Now, there were certain ideas which I had at a meeting, at least and I won't go into this now, but it seems to me quite possible that there is a certain backwards referral. I thought about this already before, but, but the kind of view which, that seems to come about from the scheme that Stuart Hameroff and I have developed does ha have a role for, somehow it looks as though there was earlier action. It's not really done like that. Consciousness does have an effective action, but you get misled by these other experiments. I don't want to go into this because it takes us too far afield. The act, the ins, is, yes, other things about tests. I gave this example of a chess position. This actually was developed from an earlier set of chess positions which were designed by David Norwood and um, William Hartston. And they constructed, I think it was a hundred chess positions, chess problems, and they were given to a number of human beings and a number of computers, programs, and half of the problems were designed to be easy for computers and hard for human beings. Those were ones which involved a lot of calculation, but there was no obvious reason or rhyme or reason. They were just, you didn't understand the reason for it or anything, but it, you, by pure computation, you could, and of course the computers did well there and the humans did not do well at all. But then the, half the other problems were like the one I gave. There's a nice one with a row of pawns that goes across, or an incomplete row, and the white, ha the white player has, is supposed to decide what move to make, and the move is to complete this barrier of pawns rather than take the rook, which is the obvious thing which the computer does. And you can see the distinction, the understanding what the barrier of pawns does as opposed to the pure calculation that the computer does. So these are tests which do show a difference between conscious thinking or conscious understanding and pure computation. Now, she brought up the issue of creativity and um, many people have studied this. Margaret Bowden, I wrote a book about this and I talked to her quite a bit uh, about this. And the question is, can you make computers which do creative things? I've never thought of this as a very good test, particularly art work, because you can never tell, you know, is it really creative? Is it doing something wonderful, uh, which is conveying some new feeling or something? 
and you could put the feeling, think, make the computer think, you, you think that it may have some feeling or something. It's very difficult to know whether it's been creative or not. So I deliberately don't, um, I mean, when I talked about the Gödel theorem, for instance, I mean, clearly Gödel himself was being immensely creative in his creation of this uh, theorem which he produced. But I don't stress that. I don't stress the creativeness that Gödel undoubtedly had in, crea in creating that result. What I stress is the ability that just somebody who is a reasonably good mathematician has in following the argument. So this, the following of the argument and understanding the argument, you don't have to be creative. You don't have to be somebody who can pull things out of goodness knows where. The understanding is something which you can follow what Gödel did and you can understand what he did and you can understand why the result is something which is true if you trust the, the axiom system or the rules to give you only truths. So that's something where you can see the difference. It's very hard, I think, to see the difference between creativity and it's just random production of something which is different from what had been done before. Is that really creative or not? Do you have to be, have an army of artists who just decide whether they think it's really creative? Or not? It's very difficult, that. So I'm sure there is something different in being creative, and I think there is something in genuine being creativeness, creativity, which is different from what computers do when they produce random things. I do believe there is a big difference, but it's extremely hard to test and be objective about that. Now, another point that was brought up, um, let's just see if I can, yes, about Stephen Hawking, I guess. Uh, I'm not quite sure what the point was here. He certainly made a point that I didn't agree with, which was to do, I don't think that was the one you were making, though, about um, the dangers of, uh, of artificial intelligence. And I think Stephen was taking the view that the computers would do things that, would be cleverer than us, or I would say more intelligent than us, when they have more computational ability. I simply don't agree with him on that. I think there is something quite different going on, and that's what my point was meant to be. I think maybe the point that you were making about uh, Stephen Hawking was more his uh, determined atheism, and saying that there was nothing beyond, uh, I mean, the world came from nothing and it goes to nothing. I don't really hold that kind of view myself. I think there is something out there. I wouldn't call it any kind of a religious view at all. But I would say that there is something, there is a meaning out there in some sense. I wouldn't like to attribute that to any kind of religious view. But nevertheless, I think that the view that I try to present is something which does give meaning to things. And that there is something out there in, in consciousness which gives it meaning. And that there is something in the world which has value and that I would also say, I believe this quite strongly, that consciousness is not a feature which is restricted to humanity, and that I so strongly believe that it's true with animals. Uh, it's certainly true with uh, dogs, it's true with elephants, it's certainly true with monkeys, gorillas, it's true with dolphins. <laughs> I don't know how far down it goes. Squirrels, I believe, also have this quality. Mice. I, do, I know this, mice can be extremely creative in a certain sense because they infected our house and I used to have these traps which were, uh, you know, they didn't kill them, I like, didn't want to kill the mice, but the ability that the mice have to go in and step over the thing which is a trap, clean the thing out of all the little nuts and pieces of chocolate and it's completely wiped clean and the thing has not been set. And I have a tremendous respect for mice. And I think they do this with consciousness. I think they have that ability. And I, I think we have to respect this consciousness, not just in human beings, but in other creatures as well. I think that's probably enough, I c all that I can say in relation to your comments. Thank you for that.